Hello! Welcome to an adventure. Uh, I hope that you're all having a good Wednesday, or if by some chance it is Thursday where you are, a good Thursday. I think those are the only two options right now. Uh, unless you are receiving this traveling in time or watching a VOD, in which case I hope you're having a good day whatever day it is for you. Uh, <laughs> If you're unfamiliar, uh, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, also known on the internets as Rogan27, and this is Archival Adventures, uh, which is a streaming show that I do every Wednesday here from the University Libraries at Virginia Tech, uh, where I share materials from special collections and university archives. So um, hopefully that's what you're here for, and if you came here for something else, hopefully you'll stick around and explore history with us today anyway. Um, let me go ahead and say hello to whoever's in chat. Um, Lord Portico, it is good to see you. Hi Shadows of Life, hi T Squared, hi Fluid Anne. Um, it's supposed to be Wednesday. Um, indeed, I think it is supposed to be Wednesday. Um, I, I did do the adjustments that, hang on one second. Come on phone. Um, I did do the adjustments. I need my phone so that I can bring up the text for the thing that I'm going to read to you in just a second. Um, so I lowered the camera and moved the light a little. So I have a full view of the monitor now, which means I'll be able to look there as I read uh, whatever it is that we're looking at, which will be better than me staring down like this the entire stream. Um, Slow but steady. This is uh, episode 72. We're uh, like a year and a half into this thing and we're, we're making improvements. Um, so 
I do uh, like to start off the stream by just um, making sure that we acknowledge and read out uh, so that it's fresh every week the land and labor acknowledgement from the university. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there should be some commands popping into chat uh, that give some links and stuff, but Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes, and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to UTPROSIM that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So, uh, as always, I think it's important that we pay attention to that. Um, it is a statement that is um, one of the, it, it was a big improvement when they made the changes to it. It acknowledges um, that the institution doesn't have a great history with regard to um, historically oppressed people. Uh, and commits to doing better. And um, so I think it's important that people look at the institution and see if it's living up to that commitment because it explicitly does make a commitment there. So uh, I'm not going to comment on whether I think we're meeting that commitment at the moment, but um, if you feel like providing that feedback, I'm sure administration would accept the feedback that you put in. Um, I, I don't know that, I'll, that I would say that they'd be happy about the feedback they receive, but I'm sure if people provide that feedback that they will actually, um, there are people here who will pay attention to that. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> what we're looking at today from the archives is a collection of materials that spans from nine, or 1899 through 1950 something. I'll get the actual like full dates in just a second for you. Um, it's the Frank L. Robeson papers, and Robeson was a professor of physics here, uh, was the um, head of the physics department, and um, the, the physics building was named after him. Um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned at the end of stream last year, 1899 to 1954, um, I think I mentioned at the end of stream last week, um, the building, <laughs> that was named after him <clears throat> is the building that used to house a nuclear reactor here on campus. Um, <clears throat> I don't believe there's anything in these papers about that, and I did not end up having time to pull any of those materials. Um, oh, I love that every week during stream, this computer um, tells me it's time to install Windows updates. Uh, <laughs> it is not my computer. I don't control it. I don't decide when those updates get installed, but it loves to pop up during stream and say, hey, now's a good time to do these updates. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Uh, I don't have any of the materials about the nuclear reactor today, but I will plan to do a stream of <clears throat> what information I do have in our collections about that nuclear reactor at some time in the future, because I think it's an interesting topic and I've dug and Doug and Doug looking for things about it um, and have found a few sources, uh, maybe not as many as I would hope, but we have some things. Uh, so I, I will try to do a stream on that at some point. Uh, we are ready for science. Yay, science. Yes, awesome. <clears throat> so let me do a little bit of background on Frank Robeson. 
and then we'll start looking at the materials. Um, I will say there are six boxes. There is a lot of papers, or there are a lot of papers. Um, so if you look at the finding aid and you look at the listing of, um, like, uh, on the finding aid, there's a container list. And if you look through that container list and you see a topic that you would like me to pull out so we can look at, be sure to let me know in chat so I make sure that I pull that folder and we look at it. Um, Otherwise, I'm just going to be pulling things sort of at random. Um, captions are running over there, Lord Portico. The way they're set up on that channel, uh, you should have to scroll down. Um, and they should be in a window that can be popped out somewhere below the video window. Um, it's, it's integrated differently on that channel. So, um, All right. So Frank Robeson. Uh, we have a biographical note here. Frank Lee Robeson was born on uh, August 31st, 1884 <clears throat> in, pardon me, <clears throat> in Farmville, Virginia, to George M. and Anna M. Robeson. In 1912, he married Mary Anna Matthews. Uh, they had five children, Helen, Mary, Martha, Amenta, and Andrew. Uh, Robeson died in September 1974 in Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, and he, apparently he's buried at West, in Westview Cemetery. Um, so if you're familiar with the area, you would know where that is. Uh, Robeson graduated from Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College and Polytechnic Institute which, with a Bachelor of Science in 1904. That is um, an older name for Virginia Tech. Uh, between 1904 and 1907, he served as an instructor in mathematics and drawing, and later in mathematics and graphics. From 1910 to 1913, he was an instructor in mathematics and experimental engineering. In 1913, he received a Master of Arts from Columbia University. Uh, from 1913 to 1917, he served as an associate professor of physics and from 1917 to 1955, except for a leave in 1922-23, as a professor of physics. He completed a PhD at Johns Hopkins in 1923 before returning to teach at Virginia Polytechnic Institute, another name for Virginia Tech. Uh, between <clears throat> 1936 and 1941, uh, the finding aid actually says between 1036 and 1941, which is a very large date range, uh, but there appears to just be a typo in the finding aid here. Uh, between 1936 and 1941, he was the head <clears throat> of the physics department. After retiring in September 1954, he was granted emeritus status in honor of his long career at VPI as a student and teacher. The Department of Physics building, completed in 1960, was dedicated Robeson Hall in 1969. And a portrait of him it says a portrait of him hangs in the building. This finding aid was written in, uh, 2015, I think. Uh, yeah, this finding aid was written in July of 2015, so I can't guarantee that there's still a portrait of him in the building. Um, the collection includes papers from his tenure as a student um, at uh, Virginia Tech, Columbia University, and Johns Hopkins, as well as subject and research files from his nearly 50 years as an instructor and professor, uh, dating from, uh, covering dates from 1899 to 1954. There are notebooks, uh, sketch and composition books, personal correspondence, research on topics related to math, physics, and drawing, uh, notes and lectures from classes taught, Virginia Academy of Science documents, papers, and publications, and a few photographs and negatives. So, um, and it looks like the arrangement of the folders, so the topics that you see listed, if you go through the container list in the finding aid, um, those are the names from the folders themselves as they came to us. Um, and then uh, it's arranged in chronological order with undated materials at the end. Um, but so the folder names are the folder names as they were when the collection was brought to us or given to us. So back in 1036, it was called the Etheric Alchemy Department. <laughs> 
Yeah, I imagine the study of physics would have been very different in 1036. Um, anyway, I think it's time that we actually start looking at some of these materials. Uh, I think I'm going to start with the undated box, um, just because uh, that one contains the photographs and I remember... Oops, sorry, it's on the bottom shelf of the cart. Um, I, I glanced through a couple things in this box when I was looking for a graphic for the promotional image for today. Um, so I have a little bit of a sense of what's in here and there were some pretty cool things. So uh, I'm going to start here, but like I said, if there's a topic that you see listed that you particularly would like me to pull out, um, if you can give me a box and folder number, uh, let me know or, um, or give me a topic that you see on the contents list. Uh, you can just tell me, oh, I see a topic labeled this. Uh, let me know and I will um, make sure that we get to that today. Uh, I'm going to switch to document view. You're just going to see the, the um, tabletop right now, but uh, sounds mysterious and exciting. Let's see what is in this box. Well, correspondence not dated. That's probably not one I'm going to look through. Correspondence is fun and interesting, uh, but for stream it's better if I have some idea what's in it. So just a folder labeled correspondence um, can be interesting, but it can also be extraordinarily boring. Uh, so I'm not going to start on that. <clears throat> An exercise on the sphere of geometry of space. That could be interesting. Electrostatics. Electricity and magnetism, illustrations of street, steam engines, steam turbines, uh, and camping engines. I'm not certain of, of that word. Um, we might look at that. Manuscript in, in, index to notes on physics. Uh, negatives. I don't think I have the tools here to properly show negatives on stream, but um, we could try. Notes for a course in thermodynamics, photographs, physics and experiments in electricity and magnetism, radiation, and thermodynamics second term. I think I'm going to start with this exercise on the sphere of geometry of space, because that sounds interesting to me. Um, I'm probably going to end up pulling out that folder on radiation, possibly some thermodynamics. I know there's a folder about um, atomic theory from like 1923, which um, seeing what scientists knew about atomic theory in 1923 sounds interesting to me. So that's one that I want to try and prioritize for stream. Um, but those are kind of some of the things that are in this collection, which is, um, I think, fascinating. I'm, I'm very fascinated by, like, sort of early explorations into the science of physics and um, atomic theory and things like that. Um, ooh, let's see. I need to switch back just real quick and make one quick adjustment to the camera. Um, but rather than having you uh, deal with all the jostling as I move this camera that I have taped down to the desk to a different position, uh, I'm just going to let you watch my face while I move where this camera is. Because um, I taped it so it wouldn't like bump around quite so much, but then I didn't really get a chance to test where I had put it. Um, as always, completely unpolished, which is part of how you know it's live. Uh, all right, an exercise on the sphere geometry of space. Um, an excellent topic for today, uh, given that we are continuing to get new images from NASA's brand new infrared space telescope. Um, absolutely amazing images that are coming from that. Uh, and um, also, uh, today is the anniversary, I think the, what is it, the 53rd anniversary of um, the day that uh, Neil Armstrong first set foot on the moon. 
um, which I would have to look at the events to know for certain, uh, but I presume was also the day that Buzz Aldrin first set foot on the moon. Uh, but I would have to review the actual sequence of events to know if they both went out on the first day. I assume they did. I, I just, I, I know they were both out at the same time at some point, but honestly, I've never paid that much attention, but when I started to make the statement. Anyway, all the buzz online today is about Neil Armstrong's first step on the moon, and it's like, but wasn't Buzz Aldrin there too? But anyway, <laughs> I'm distracting myself. Um, electrical laboratory notes. I will uh, make sure that we get to that one. Uh, or And also lettering for engineering students. Yes, Shadows of Life, I will make sure that we get to those. Hi, Hannah. Uh, it's good to see you. Introduction to the Sphere Geometry of Space. Uh, this appears to be handwritten notes. As you can see, um, this is like a, a study folder. It's got ruled paper in it. Um, you can see um, here in the middle, that is insect um, remnant uh, appears to have had moths in it at some point. Um, but it's got these metal uh, clips to, to hold things into the folder um, that have not been removed. They appear to be in decent condition uh, and probably there's no reason to remove them at this point. Um, but yeah. Also, yeah, okay. Um, analogously to, wow, uh, I'm gonna try and read it up there because I, I set that up for that, but um, it is, of course, in script rather than printed, which, and this script is gonna take my brain a second to adapt to. Analogously to the procedure in the uh, circle geometry of the plane, we should first take up certain fundamental definitions and theorems in the old x, y, z coordinates. In the plane, our dual elements were the point and line. In space, we shall have the point and plane for three points, determine a plane and reciprocally three planes determine a point in ordinary space. Makes sense, three-dimensional coordinate system, uh, x, y, and z axes. Um, the power of a point with respect to a sphere I do not know what word this is. The power of a point with respect to a sphere, uh, something we'll define as possibly we. I think it, it looks very similar to what I had read as we before. So I think it's we will define as the asterisk of the tangent length from the point to the sphere. Let our sphere be, wow. Uh, I don't even know the names of all of the symbols in this equation. So it, it does appear to be um, S, capital S is the sphere. And then there's a three line equals sign and I assume that has a name and I have no idea what the name of that is. Um, it is amazing diagram work. That diagram work was definitely done with um, with rulers and probably a compass. I don't feel an indentation in the paper where like the point of a compass would have been, but I don't know how else you get a circle that is so perfectly a circle. Uh, the triple equals means identical to. 
Thank you, Philip. Do you know what the name of that symbol is? Because I, it's a symbol I had not, I was not familiar with. I, I apparently never made it far enough in maths to um, definitional equals. Thank you, Lord Portico. Yeah, that was, it was just a symbol I don't know. So S definitional equals um, X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared plus Z minus C squared minus X squared, I assume that's X squared and not like a, a miniature T, uh, equals zero. Oh, I get why, why there's gonna be the thing there. So it's defining S as this equation uh, where all of that equals zero. Um, and then in parentheses there at the end, I'm uncertain. Is that an I for like, I, I don't know what, I don't know what that parenthetical is at the very end. Equivalence sign. Doesn't remember a damn thing from the last time you used that symbol. I think uh, just from looking at it, I'm getting the context of what it's used for. So we're defining the term S um, as this equation, but it is a complete equation uh, with all of this on the left side of the equals being equal to zero. Um, and so we're defining the term S as a full equation, not saying that S is equal to a certain calculation, uh, which makes it, it's different than just an equal sign. And I, I think it makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you. And hopefully my inexpert description of it makes sense as well. Uh, you're wishing you were on a bigger monitor so you could read. I have zoomed in. I could zoom in further. Uh, I zoomed into about page width, but I can zoom in so that you can see the actual like equation a bit a bit better. Um, and then we'll autofocus so that uh, so that you all will have it in focus. But here is here is the equation. So. Um, I don't know what this parenthetical here is about, uh, that looks sort of like an I or a one to the first power inside of a parentheses. I'm not certain what that is. Um, uh, and then this I don't think is just an underlined P. That to me looks like a symbol, but one that I'm unfamiliar with. Um, so if anybody can define that symbol for me, uh, that would be helpful. But um, any part, or, or I think it's like for any point X, Y, Z, And then whatever that is, a, a, a tangent. I, I'm not sure. Is that just a symbol or I'm not sure. Oh, gotcha. Reflecting the arbitrary point P in the diagram. Gotcha. Oh, and it does use the same. Thank you, Portico. So um, that symbol is any point, X, Y, and Z. So point a, uh, the, the line point to A is a tangent, and the point MN is a secant to the sphere. Wow, I did not, ex I, I knew there were maths in this collection. I did not know that I was going to dive so deeply into um, geometry, although the I should have anticipated uh, geometrical equations when the first thing I opened was about spatial geometry. Uh, <laughs> line segments P PS or PA and PA PMN. Yeah. Um, I was very much a language arts person and very much not a maths person. Um, the only maths I enjoyed was uh, chemical formulas in chemistry class. Um, 
Anyway, then from elementary geometry, uh, oh. The abs, it, so the line over it, I don't know what that means. I don't remember what that means. I think it's like the value of segment AP squared, possibly the absolute value of AP squared, or I don't, I don't remember. Oh, does the line over it just means line segment? See, I really don't remember any of this stuff. Like, this is not where my knowledge base is. Uh, all right, so line segment AP squared uh, equals line segment CP squared minus... Uh, <clears throat> I, I had read that as x squared before, but this is the second time I've seen it written this way, and I think it might just be a t. Because it's very intentionally turned on its side. I don't think it's an x. I think it's a t. Uh, equals um, pm dot, or pm times pn, I think is what that is. Uh, PA and PMN without the overline just means line. Gotcha, you need the top line for line segment. Damn, you 17 year old knowledge. Uh, I mean, this was stuff that I barely touched on um, and I did not do well in geometry. Um, and that was well over 20 years ago. So uh, I apologize to anybody out there who is a maths enthusiast uh, and, and understands this stuff if I am frustrating uh, as I try to read, read through it. Um, so anyway, uh, this first page is defining uh, how to calculate a sphere in space. And I just noticed the, um, up here where it says, uh, the power of a point with respect to a sphere, we will define as, or is that power? Yeah, it's definitely power. We will define as the square of the tangent length from the point to the sphere. Um, the asterisk here is functioning as Oh, I left out a word, and he added the word sphere at the, or square at the bottom here. Anyway, uh, so this booklet continues. We, we could definitely spend an entire stream trying to read the whole thing and understand the maths involved. We won't. Um, but my gosh, look at his diagram work. I am not going to dive into trying to figure out the math that went into this diagram and the um, the enlarged what what is spherical tr tribadrow? T-R-I-B-E-D-R-O-W. This shape. I'm not going to even attempt to try and get into the maths that go into making that shape. I just want to be amazed at the meticulous line work in drawing the shapes in his notes. It's amazing. It looks printed on the page. Yeah, this is all hand done. And that is a very interesting shape. And a, my mind breaks a little even trying to conceive of the geometry required in order to describe that shape and then further to describe the shaded regions on that shape. Um, I don't have the maths required to do that. Uh, I'm sure they are detailed in this, in this booklet. You went to art class and learned stippling before... Oh, he went to art class and learned stippling before he did physics. Um, he did teach drawing. 
He taught maths and drawing. Um, and yes, I keep saying maths uh, because I think it's more accurate. I understand it is sort of the British approach. And in, in, in America, we tend to say math, uh, but there are multiple maths. Uh, so anyway, um, let me make sure drafting class used to be required by some physics programs. You're very lucky that it wasn't by the time you went through. Uh, I lost the thing. I'm scrolling back up. Uh, box one, folder five, and box one, folder seven uh, were requested. So we will re return to box six and sort of some of the other things that I saw in here, but we'll do that in a moment after I get to the requested items. Box one, folders five and seven. Uh, box one. Hang on, I, I may slide off screen for a second. Folder five, folder seven. All right. All right, let me get back, catch back up with chat here. <clears throat> All right, so box one, folder five, which was one of the two that was requested, um, was labeled lettering for engineering students. It's dated 1904. So this would have been when he was a student. Um, and there's a, there's a book inside. Um, I assume one that is more of a workbook type book, um, but we will find out. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can kind of get the whole thing on screen here. Um, lettering for draftsmen, engineers, and students. A practical system of freehand lettering for working drawings. Uh, appears to be written by someone named Reinhardt, uh, and it is published by D. Van Nostrand Company Publishers, New York. Um, it's interesting. That is. On the monitor that I have, the the um, the blue on this is very blue. Uh, don't think it's quite that blue on um, the full stream. Also, I may have to hang on. Sorry, I have to angle this up a little bit because it is uh, so that I can even open the book and show you. Um, because of the arm on the camera. It would be nice when I get the overhead camera uh, um, fully set up, but let's see. Apparatus for flow of steam through an office. <laughs> you can see the little ink spills here on this uh, recycled paper. Taking notes on the back of a thing. Um, all of this stuff in the at the front here is just like extra scraps of paper. There's not really notes even on most of it. President William R. Uh, William B. Rogers. President of what? Uh... Church calendar. Marymount Press. No idea. MIT. Thank you, Key Squared. Which makes sense. Uh, the, the, there was a mention of Boston on the back. Um, so this must have been after Virginia Tech and when he was at Boston. Appears to have been published in 1901. Copyright in 1895. And looking over the books on lettering, which have come under the writer's notice, 
He has found that while doing full justice to the principle of ornamentation and the theories governing the shaping of each letter, no author has yet attempted to treat lettering from a purely practical point of view. The need of a practical work on lettering, however, has been and is daily experienced by many draftsmen, and in the following pages the writer has endeavored to set forth the proper methods of forming purely freehand lettering in a simple, easily acquired way, giving at the same time the proper safeguards against the errors most commonly committed. The letters exhibited are actual freehand work and can readily be copied. In this respect, the writer has made a radical departure from the works of similar character, which generally give ornate, carefully engraved alphabets, being a little more used to the average draftsman than ordinary printed type. Id est, they can only be copied with a great sacrifice of time and patience. Id est meaning that is, uh, they can only be copied with a great sacrifice of time and patience. The whole system outlined is the result of the writer's experience during years of practice on the staff of a leading technical journal and is intended to be a thoroughly practical guide for doing the best class of work in the shortest possible time. Brooklyn, September 1895, Charles W. Reinhardt. <clears throat> All right. There's an additional preface uh, to the third edition that I'm, I'm not going to read that whole thing, but inclined lettering. In the following system of lettering, no attempt has been made to imitate any special form of printed alphabet, and for all ornate and elaborate lettering, the draftsman is referred to some one of the many published collections of this character. What is here intended is to illustrate and describe a type of lettering that looks well upon working drawings, is reduced to its simplest form, one that is rapidly made and is clear and distinct under almost any reduction by photography. It is, in fact, especially designed for photo reproduction. With the purpose of fairly treating the subject, the lettering here illustrated has been reproduced without any attempt at touching up or cleaning. It is actual freehand work, such as should be used in general practice. The ordinary slanting and further on the upright lettering are described in a somewhat detailed manner as when the draftsman once becomes proficient in forming these two types properly, it will then be very e a very easy matter for him to form also the more ornamental letters satisfactory. The first requisite is to produce sharp, clean corners and bold lines of uniform strength, and this is especially necessary in work for photo reproduction, as usually such apparently unimportant things as filled-in corners and uneven lines are greatly exaggerated on the plate. In Figure 1, the correct and incorrect ways of doing this are shown. It will be well at first, for the purpose of obtaining clean corners, to resort to the artifice of slightly curving the lines outward at their ends, as exhibited on the third line of Figure 1. For very large letters, the writer finds a ballpoint pen most satisfactory. Huh. So, huh. Um, the top line, which is labeled incorrect, uh, is sort of kind of more bold, um, but it's got extra fill uh, in spots. It, it looks much more like what you would get um, if you were working towards doing like calligraphy with a uh, fountain pen. Uh, where on certain curves you press down a little bit more and you get a thicker line, um, and on straightaways you get thinner lines and things like that. Uh, the second and third are both correct. The second one being um, just single stroke lettering, and they mention a ballpoint pen would be uh, most satisfactory for achieving the effect desired because you don't get that difference in uh, line width that you get uh, with varying pressure on a fountain pen. 
a ballpoint pen will give you a uniform line width, uh, sort of regardless of how much pressure you put. Uh, and so one stroke, meaning forming the letters in just a single go. Um, so this all makes perfect sense to me as I look at it. Um, the difference in the third line is it has the slightly curved ends that were mentioned um, I yeah that it, it mentioned in the in the, the writing so it, interesting the thicks and thins of lettering aid in reading it, that is true and I honestly don't I to me sorry uh, I don't have a problem with the the top one. I can see how it would take longer to do. Um, Cause it was definitely not one stroke. But honestly it's very clean lettering regardless. Uh, and and I think it would re reproduce fine, but uh, for medium letters, not less than two millimeters high, he uses a uh, Sonen, uh, Sonikens number 108 or 208. And for small size letters, Gillot's number 303 or Blasny, Pure, and Company's Crow Quill Pen. All of these pens should be broken in somewhat before being applied to lettering. They should also be frequently cleaned when using waterproof ink, especially the... Uh, Sonic and pens, the nibs of the pen should, while doing this, be worked back and forth, gently, against a soft rag, uh, which process will cause the dried up particles of the ink to drop out from between them. Interesting. So yeah, it, it, this appears to just be a textbook on how to do clean lettering for uh, like drafting purposes. Um, I imagine this would be similar to like the process of learning this style of lettering and the the meticulousness uh the clean lines that are desired for lettering on um engineering documents i i've seen lettering very similar to this on a lot of the architectural drawings that we have in our collections um, I imagine the process would be similar for like learning how to effectively and cleanly letter a comic book, which while those are artistic letterings and are styled, um, and each person who does them can have their own style, uh, they all have a somewhat uniform uh, look and feel to them. Um, so I imagine if you were learning how to do lettering for comic books, it would be similar to, to essentially this kind of uh, learning process. Yeah, it shows in the diagrams that we saw and even like that tiny writing. Um, I definitely do not uh, write things that um, th this this cleanly as far as like the text. I'm gonna zoom in. I turned it sideways because it doesn't really matter for for the diagram that we're looking at, and it's just easier physically with the the camera. Um, I'm gonna just zoom in on this um, a little too far uh, because here's a diagram that has this lettering on it. Um, and so I just wanted us to be able to kind of look at that, um, <clears throat> where when it's zoomed out and we were looking at like the full page, all of this text is really, really tiny. Um, but it's, it's very clearly the lettering that we were just looking at, the letter forms and um, it definitely makes it possible to read even at a small font size. Um, it's, this is uh, mostly the slant letters. Um, there are a couple of upright letters. 
or numbers like here, the six hundred plus six hundred and thirty-four thousand um, is upright, and the rest of that text is the slant numbers. And I don't really know why they choose chose one over another in um, in how they did that, but. Yeah, so uh, this does not appear to be a workbook. It appears to just be a textbook. Um, so no, like, practice from uh, Robeson in here of, of, like, trying to do the lettering. But still, interesting. Wow, like I wouldn't even, today if I wanted to achieve effects like this, I would just go like work in a tool like Photoshop or PowerPoint or like some, some tool on the computer. I would never think to do this by hand, but of course, they used to do this by hand, uh, and there's no reason you couldn't. Um, and I just had never thought of doing it by hand. Cool. And here we have some, like, more calligraphic lettering. This is a really cool textbook. I wonder what a modern version of this textbook is like. You couldn't do this by hand. There are several reasons that you won't. Um, it would take practice. And I would get impatient really quickly. But that's, that's a cool book. Practical System of Freehand Lettering. That one was a neat one. Thank you for requesting that one. I hope that uh, I hope that you got to see what I mean, what you were hoping for with that. The other one you requested was Electrical Laboratory Notes from 1904. Um, your normal handwriting is hard for you to read. Um, I mean, mine is just sloppy. If I took my time, I. No, that's a lie. If I took my time, mine is still sloppy. It, mine just doesn't look good. Uh, but I also think a lot of people, just like hearing your voice, most people do not like the sound of their own voice. I think a lot of people also do not like the way their own handwriting looks, while other people uh, think that it looks better than, than most people think their own looks. Anyway. Um, slotted in here we have a photograph of the Corps of Cadets at Festival Hall in St. Louis. Um, some handwritten letter notes. Uncertain. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at it to see if I can figure out where it begins and I don't know that I can. The only guide I have is that this is labeled page two. Uh, but with all the cross outs and things, I don't know where the beginning of it is. We may come back to that. First, I want to look at this electrical laboratory notes. <clears throat> Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Blacksburg, Virginia. Session 0304. And no, it does not mean 2003, 2004. This is 1903 and 1904. F.L. Robeson, 04. And I don't actually think any of this uh, was pre-printed in the book. All of this is handwritten by Robeson himself. 
in the front of this blank notebook. It's very interesting, his um, drafting text versus uh, his normal handwriting. <laughs> One is very much easier for me to read. It bothers you that electrical and laboratory um, and notes all use different fonts, different typeface. Uh, I don't know. Note. The numbers of these experiments correspond to the numbers of the same experiments in Nichols's electrical lab I'm uncertain what this last word is. It's possibly review volume two, but uh, just really uncertain. Useless fact from Wikipedia. Festival Hall was part of the World's Fair campus. They were very dramatic but temporary buildings. The pipe organ there was later moved to Wanamaker's department store in Philadelphia, which is now a Macy's, where it is still played for special events. So cool, that useless fact, or it's not a useless fact, it's an interesting fact. It's a, um, is relating to this photograph here of the Corps of Cadets at uh, Festival Hall in St. Louis. And indeed, um, I mean, this is in a notebook from 1904 that does not guarantee that this photograph is from 1904-ish time frame. Um, uh, I'm doing a quick um, internet search because um, there is a good chance that it is indeed a photograph from 1904 because, actually, no, I mean, it, this photograph is from 1904. That is the only year that this photograph could have been taken. Uh, given the information that Key Squared shared that um, Festival Hall in St. Louis was part of the World's Fair campus and it was a temporary building uh, that was later removed. And the World's Fair in St. Louis, which was known as the, um, oh, I lost it, the Louisiana Purchase Celebration or something like that, um, uh, hang on, I can get back to it really quick here. Yeah, the, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition um, was only there from April to December of 1904, so this photograph has to be from 1904. Um, and that is the Corps of Cadets. But in 1904, all students at Virginia Tech would have been in the Corps of Cadets. It was a requirement of attending. Um, We're just discovering all sorts of neat things as we, which is the whole point. Like, I didn't expect that pulling up a folder, electrical laboratory notes, that we were going to randomly find a photograph of the Corps of Cadets at the 1904 World's Fair. Number one, motor generator test. And we have some lovely diagrams. Oh my gosh, he was amazing at doing diagrams. Look at those diagrams. Just amazing. Uh, I don't know the words. All right, the external shunt. Something. 
the external shunt cover. Curve? I don't, I don't know what that word is. Uh, I would appreciate if anybody can make out what that word is. I, I will definitely zoom in for you. Um, I think maybe it's curve. Because I, I think it's the external shunt curve, which would make the next sentence, this curve is determined by the location of points whose abscesses are the external currents? That doesn't make sense to me, but and whose ordinates are the corresponding. Generators usually characterized by the curve between current and voltage at different loads, so that would make sense. Awesome. So then what, it, what is this word? So we've got the ordinates and then another characteristic of it and I don't know what that word is. A, B. Okay, so abscissus. That was, it's just not a, a word that I'm familiar with. So, got it. Uh, the curve is this ordinate and abscess, AKA axis. Awesome. Thank you, key squared. It's, it's a term I have never seen before. So that's, and this is a thing. Um, working with old documents that are written in uh, somebody's handwriting rather than printed. Uh, so uh, what in America we call cursive uh, versus print lettering. Um, old handwritten documents where people wrote in script. Um, and a lot of times the letter forms in just everyday writing are not well-defined. So if you look at the word determined here, it's mostly just a bunch of bumps. And it's really only the context of the D at the beginning and the E and then the T with the cross on it and ending in D and the length of the word that tells you that that word is determined. Um, so partly context of where it is in the sentence and what word makes sense there uh, with the couple of clues that you get from letter forms that you're able to make out um, that tell you what the word is, especially when it's a long word like that where you get lots of just bumps because M's and I's and E's and N's and U's and W's all look the same. They all look identical. It's just up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. In many, many, many handwritten documents. Um, and so if you encounter a word that is in a language that is not your primary language or is not the primary language of the document you're reading, or is a term you have never seen before, or is a misspelled word, or in fact, the document is from before spellings were standardized, it can be really hard to figure out what the word is. And that's just a, 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 a stumbling block of working with old documents. Um, it was already a little archaic back then too. Looks like a diagram of a traditional classroom demonstration where you can show that an electrical generator and an electrical motor are essentially the same device run in different directions, but with much greater loss using it one way or other, uh, depending on how it's designed, which is why you'd 
want to talk about comparing the resulting curves. Interesting. So I'm going to try and actually finish the sentence here. Uh, this curve is determined by the location of points whose abscissas are the external currents and whose ordinates are the corresponding uh, PDs at the brushes. The necessary connections are shown in figure one, the variable load being the adjustable uh, water rheostat shown. The dynamo tested was a Westinghouse rotary combustor, possibly? I'm uncertain. I, I'm uncertain because it doesn't look like there's a B in the middle of that word, but uh, a Westinghouse rotary something. Uh, seven and a half kilowatts, 20, or 62.5 amps, 125 volts. Uh, the voltimeter used was the Weston moving coil type, reading to 150 volts by single volts. Uh, the anometer, possibly? I'm not sure what... was a Weston millivoltimeter with standard uh, resistance in parallel. Rotary converter, converter is possible. Yeah, a rotary converter is a thing. Um, that is entirely possible and yes, uh, that, that Absolutely, Westinghouse Rotary Converter is what that says. I'm not certain on this one. Uh, it was a Weston millivoltimeter or millivoltometer. Um, I think it's anometer, but I'm not sure. It's it's really hard with just all of the letters are just bumps. Um, anyhow, in beginning the experiment, the external circuit is at first left open, and the resistance in the shunt field is adjusted till the terminal PD is normal. I don't know what PD is. It's only been presented as a an abbreviation, so um, having not done a whole lot with electronics in this um, ammeter, A-M-M-E-T-E-R. Thank you, key squared. Measures things in amperes. Um, let's see. The no load reading is then taken. Then the load is gradually increased and the simultaneous external currents and terminal PDs uh, read at the different loads. As this test also accompanied a joint efficing test of the motor and dynamo, the revolutions of the dynamo were also taken. It's also really hard to figure out words uh, when they make a mistake and just write over top of the word and press harder so that they know which lines to pay attention to, uh, which is totally a thing I have done in my own notes over the years. But wow, does it make it hard to figure out what they write. Uh, potential difference, maybe, or potential displacement. Uh, from context, you're guessing uh, what is meant by it is voltage. Cool. Yeah, I'm not, I haven't done this, like, kind of um, intentional electronic 
like building circuits and things like that. It's not something that I've ever done. Um, all the values taken are given in the table below under the following names. I equals external current, I think. It's an abbreviation, so I'm not sure. V equals terminal PD, W equals load in watts. The external shunt curve is, a, is appended. Uh, wow. Joint efficiency curve. The dynamo was driven by a 25 kilowatt direct current motor, left coupled. Motor connections above in figure two. Uh, the motor had shunt field, the volts, um, Vs, and the current Is being noted. Also, the total current IT and the PD at the brushes being kept so nearly constant at the value VA by hand regulation of a water rheostat. The current IA through the ammeter was obtained by subtracting IS from IT. Similarly, WT the total watts defined nope the total watts delivered to the motor were obtained by adding wa equals ia plus va to ws equals is plus vs these values of va vs it is were read simultaneously with those for the external shunt characteristic and are tabulated with them below. The corresponding efficiency is equal to IV over WT equals W over WT are also tabulated and curve attached. Whew. <laughs> Voltage potential difference, measuring the voltage drop between two points. Belt coupled? I... Entirely possible. I have no idea which words you were looking at because I just, I powered through it. Uh, dynamo driven by a motor with a dry, drive belt. Oh. Um, driven by... Okay, so it definitely says the dynamo was driven by a 25 kilowatt direct current motor left cup or belt coupled, possibly. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It is belt coupled. <laughs> God's power engineering, gross. Definitely still a math problem you'd assign in engineering physics class, though only someone specializing in electrical power systems would be likely to have to do the experiment by hand anymore. We put power into the motor via a dynamo and we checked the amount of power we put in by looking at voltage current and then looked at the power we got out from the motor and came up with an efficiency using math. Yeah, uh, excellent translation, Portico. Um, and then we have the curves as, as drawn. But, so, this was an electrical engineering test being done in 1904. Um, so what was this called? This is a motor generator test. So this was uh, less than a hundred years after the invention of an of the first electromagnetic generator. So 
So less than a hundred years that this technology had been in existence. Um, and this is a student experiment. Um, and then you have the table of the values. So it, it's interesting. I'm not going to read through all of the experiments in here, but uh, compound characteristic, internal shunt characteristic, external shunt curve. Experiment number 35. Exploration of the field of a bipolar motor. Shunt exerted? Just look at the freaking diagrams. This guy's amazing. Look at the drawing. Sorry. Just amazing drawings. Diagram of connections for test of 30 horsepower independent motor, I'm assuming. IND period. Uh, induction motor, possibly. I'm trying to think what else that could be an abbreviation for. Induction motor. And here's that word, A-M-M-E-T-E-R, ammeter shunt. Press coil, watt meter, series coil, and and we this is all uh, examples of the the lettering that we just saw. It's so like I wonder how many drafts did he do before like inking a final draft or a final copy of this diagram. Because it's, it's very meticulous, down to just like the little, um, as you have, I, I've seen this kind of diagramming done uh, for like layouts of circuit boards and things like that, um, where you've got a, a channel here and all of these other channels have to jump over it. And it's got that tiny little loop to indicate that they are passing over it. Um, and it's just so meticulous. You can't get your lettering that even when you're using CAD software, let alone by hand. Yeah, and just, wow. What's silly is, or silly, I don't know if silly is the right word. What strikes me about this is a lot of elements of this diagram are similar to the kinds of diagrams that I've done in like database design, um, where r defining relationships between data points in different tables, um, and the line work and like the little, it's, it's specifically that little thing of like following a line and it jumps over another line um, that brings to mind um, uh, database mapping for me um, because I've done database mapping and I haven't done this kind of work, but uh, diagramming it is. <laughs> You'll say it again, they look printed. They do and, and they are all hand drawn and it is, oh my gosh. It's multi-layered. The precision, perfectly drawn circles, perfectly excised circles. Now here, I definitely, uh, uh, running my finger over it, I can feel, um, the indentation, and I can, if I get really close, I can see the, the pinprick dot from where the compass was, uh, was um, anchored into the page to draw the circles, but wow. 
<laughs> just, just wow. Sorry, I, I didn't expect to be marveling over his drawing work. I expected to be marveling over like early 20th century uh, understanding of atomic physics, which we are going to get to. Um, and I will, I will hydrate Portico. Thank you. <clears throat> But like, it's in a freaking notebook where All right. I was gonna say it's in a notebook where he had to like cut out those circles and and like do it perfectly and except that he didn't have to. He could have done multiple tries because this page here is actually um, a page that has been removed from the book somewhere. Uh, had the drawing done on it, had the circle cut out of it, and then is, is pasted in. But at the same time, it's pasted in so perfectly that it lines up exactly where it needs to go. And I don't know if that's because it was pasted in and then the what was under it was drawn afterwards or not. I, I really don't know. Uh, it's just amazing, amazing, amazing work. I don't know what um, the other students at the time were producing, so I don't know if the professor at the time realized how amazing this was, or if it was indeed amazing at the time, but it's amazing to me now. <clears throat> All right. Uh, what was I gonna pull from here? Uh, radiation, wasn't it? Oh. I was gonna, I was gonna pull this one out. I don't think there's anything that we can really do with this. Um, hang on one second. I'm gonna do something that you all basically never see me do. I am going to don these stereotypical white gloves. I have two sets of gloves. I grabbed two right hands. I know, I never wear them. That's because I, I don't, I tend to work with mostly documents and old books and I, I don't do a whole lot with glossies and negatives and stuff on this stream. Um, as I said, I don't think there's going to be any way that I can adequately show these off because I did not bring a light box up today. Uh, but I will attempt. Um, to. So this folder is just labeled negatives and I, I'm absolutely, yep, I zoomed in way too far. I apologize. Uh, let me fix that. Well, they're, they're showing better than I actually thought they were gonna um, for not having a light box to um, have light come through from underneath. Artificial radioactivity induced by natural atomic par projectiles when boron is bombarded by natural alpha particles. Uh, one, Rutherford, Rutherford and Chadwick showed 1924 that energetic protons are emitted in the process. A transmutation, uh, I can't read all of it. It's too, it's too tiny on the negative. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this does not exist only in negative form in this collection. So I think we will, um, this is some of the stuff that I was hoping to show off on stream. Uh, so I think we will look for the um, 
full-size versions that are not negatives. Uh, but that one doesn't show as well. Yeah, that one doesn't show at all. Uh, so I, I do think, though, that they are just negatives of things that actually exist elsewhere in the collection. So, um, <laughs> radio sodium. Oh, it's backwards. All right, I'm going to put the negatives away and quit playing with them. I, I think they're cool. I would love to show these off as the negatives, but um, I, I think if I pull the photographs folder, I think it might have some of the same things in it and be easier to see. Yeah, indeed, I am correct. Uh, same kind of content, but in photograph form instead of in negative form, um, meaning just easier. <laughs> easier to make out what's on them. This is a photograph of the diffraction of a straight edge. Or diffraction at a straight edge. Photograph of diffraction pattern obtained with a circular opening. The central image is much overexposed. Some of these, I'm not certain what these are from. They're, they appear to be clipped out of something. The graph Below the straight edge is a graph of brightness over distance. I was unaware of that, so thank you for sharing. And since I'm still working with glossies with these photographs, that's why I still have these. Uh, gloves on here is a diagram. Zoom out. I This one's not labeled. I don't know exactly what it is a diagram of. But it is a photograph of a drawing um, that appears to be from Robeson's hand because that very much looks like drawings he drew. You can make a straight edge interference pattern like that by shining a very bright light right at the edge of a razor blade in a dark room and zooming in. Cool. Cool. Oh, that's the amateur? <laughs> Uh, here is that, uh, a print of that negative that we were looking at a moment ago. Artificial radioactivity induced by natural atomic pro projectiles. And I believe, I believe this is the graphic that I uh, scanned and used for the promotional image for today's stream, because uh, it was really cool. This is making you wish you had the setup to be able to stream about your job. That would be amazing, Hannah. Um, I would definitely tune in. I think that would be a lot of fun. <clears throat> oh, yes, Key Squared. Thank you very much for that. Um, it is indeed important that uh, we do make, make clear that um, one should not try this at home. <laughs> Uh, when boron is bombarded by natural alpha particles, one, Rutherford and Chadwick showed in 1924 that energetic protons are emitted in the process. Uh, a transmutation of sub 2 H E 4. So this is, um, 
Well, okay, I liked chemical equations. I don't remember how to read them because it has been even longer since I did that than since I did like algebra and geometry. I don't remember what the sub two in front of helium four means. I don't remember how to read it. I don't remember how to say it, but um, plus B, which I'm guessing, uh, which would be boron, uh, leads to uh, carbon 13 and hydrogen plus energy. Uh, irradiating things with alpha particles is not a fun home project. If you try, it will be a fun home project in the Alice and Bechtel sense, um, where fun home is short for funeral home. Um, so swift particle, helium, uh, bombarding a boron nucleus resulting in carbon-13, stable nucleus, and a um, hydrogen proton, uh, if I'm reading it correctly. Uh, two, Curie-Joliet uh, uh, Curie observed 1933 that neutrons and positrons are also emitted. It was postulated that um, helium plus boron uh, leading to carbon-13 plus um, neutron and electron and energy. So again, uh, the helium bombarding the boron leading to a stable carbon-13 uh, and emitting a neutron and a positive electron uh, rather than just emitting a hydrogen proton. Three, however, Curie-Joliet found in 1934 that the positron emission persists after cessation of the bombardment, attributed to the radioactivity of a product. So uh, helium bombard bombarding the boron uh, emits a neutron and then an, a radioactive unstable nucleus of N, which I'm reading as like, is that trying to think chemical periodic table? Uh, N is nitrogen. Um, which is where my brain wanted to go, but I had to double check it before I said it out loud. So um, uh, nitrogen 13 that then gives off a positive electron and the stable nucleus of carbon 13. So they're saying that the helium bombarding the boron uh, gives off a neutron leading to a, an unstable radioactive nitrogen nucleus that then um, uh, what's the term? My brain wants to say degrades, but there's an actual term for the progression there, uh, where it goes from the nitrogen to the carbon, um, and e emits the electron. De decays, yes, radioactive decay. Uh, decays from the nitrogen into the, the carbon. <clears throat> Art to electrical engineering to nuclear chemistry. <laughs> I mean, this is what an archives stream is, especially when I've got a, a maths drawing and physics professor um, uh, and his, his papers. For those new to atomic physics, Curie uh, Joliet, or Joliet Curie is the married couple of Irene uh, Marie Curie's daughter, and Frederick, who won the Nobel jointly for this work. The notation of curvy particle n versus straight elemental n is unnecessarily confusing. Well, so the, um, 
the notation that they have here um, makes sense to me. It, it's definitely chemistry and chem. I just I don't remember what like the the little two in front of it means and the little uh, five in front of it and the six. I, I don't remember what those numbers mean. I honestly don't remember what the f the numbers above mean. Um, I, I would have to refresh my memory on the chemistry. But the chemical symbols are enough to be able to sort of understand what's going on here. And the HE is helium, B is boron, C is carbon. But the lowercase n and the lowercase e here, this is a neutron. This is an electron with a positive charge because it has the plus. Um, and so that makes sense. And, and the difference between here, um, nitrogen being a capital N for the chemical symbol of nitrogen, um, uh, that's easily distinguishable in chemical notation from the lowercase n that represents a neutron. Number of protons versus total weight. Number of protons and the number of neutrons. Thank you. I, yeah, it's just been, <clears throat> I don't think I've looked at chemical formulas and actually like read chemical formulas since, uh, I want to say junior year of high school, which would have been like 1990, 95, 96. Um, so this, this, I have a bunch of this photograph that I'm trying to move past them because it's not a very interesting one. It's not labeled and anyway. Um, one labeled household meteorology. Uh, are you talking folders in the collection? Because if, if that's what you mean, Shadows of Life, I will find that folder and we'll look at it. Otherwise, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, radio sodium produced by uh, deuteron bombardment. So we have hydrogen plus sodium uh, leading to sodium... Uh, and hydrogen and energy, where it looks like a neutron has changed places, if I'm reading that correctly. So a high-speed deuteron, uh, which is a heavy hydrogen nucleus, one proton and one neutron, um, bombarding a stable nucleus of sodium-23, uh, will give off a proton and lead to a radioactive, unstable isotope of radio sodium, which is sodium-24, uh, which... The sodium appears to decay into magnesium-24, an excited nuclear energy level. I think, I think it's magnesium, Mg. Um, could be manganese, I'm not sure. Uh, giving off an electron and three million volts of kinetic energy. Um, also apparently uh, giving off gamma rays, which are also great energy at three million volts. Um, Yes, okay, Shadows. Yeah, I will grab box four folder 22 in just a second here. Um, radio phosphorus produced by Deuteron Bombardment. Um, hydrogen plus phosphorus leading to um, a different a radioactive phosphorus and uh, some hydrogen and energy. So high-speed Deuteron bombarding a stable phosphorus uh, phosphorus 31, giving off a proton, uh, leading to radioactive, unstable isotope of radiophosphorus, phosphorus 32. Phosphorus 32 then leads to sulfur 32, which is a stable sulfur unexcited. Um, uh, and it decays to that by giving off an electron and 1.7 million volts of, of kinetic energy, the stable phosphorus does not emit the gamma rays. 
they don't let you do this one in the classroom anymore for some reason. I, I think I understand why. I'm just gonna double check whether that's manganese or magnesium. MG is uh, magnesium. <clears throat> I thought it was magnesium. I just, again, I don't work with this stuff on a daily basis. So I just have to double check my, my things occasionally. But so the radio sodium is the one here that um, I think would have been really interesting. Based on just the quality of these things, these are definitely like really early uh, 20th century. I don't have dates on them, unfortunately, but the, the radio sodium here where you've got the high-speed deuteron, which is a heavy hydrogen nucleus with a proton and a neutron, bombarding stable sodium, sodium-23, um, and then emitting the proton uh, and um, resulting in the unstable isotope of radio sodium, which is sodium-24, which then decays into magnesium 24, which is an excited uh, nuclear energy magnesium, and giving off an electron with 3 million volts of kinetic energy, and gamma rays that are also at 3 million volts, would have been really exciting for people. Like, wow, we can generate so much energy by doing this. Um, this is also the type of chemical formula and, and chemical behavior that ultimately leads to the atomic bomb. <laughs> oh, you need to duck out and grab some microscopes? <laughs> uh, Keyscord, thank you for, um, for being here. Um, it has been great having your commentary during the, uh, during the stream. Um, I'm just going to thumb through the photographs here and see if there's anything else particularly that I want to take a gander at. We are, wow, already coming up towards the end of stream, so I will be sure to pull the folder that Shadows of Life um, has requested. And then that's probably the last thing that we're going to get a chance to look at today. Um, This is, this is a really cool collection. Like, a lot of professors' papers, a lot of, like, um, this type of material where we get uh, a professor donating their papers, a lot of times it's research notes for papers that they wrote or things like that. This includes his work as a student as he was learning this stuff, as well as um, instructional materials that he used to teach this stuff, um, which, boom, like those slides, those pictures of slides, I can totally see him using uh, those slides to give lectures in his class. Um, and so, Right off the bat, they're extra interesting for me from like a, I'm not an expert in this. I'm not doing research on this. It's just interesting because it's something where I could potentially understand it um, in, in a way that I might not be able to otherwise. Plus, it's atomic physics, which pretty cool. Uh, Folder 22, let's, uh, Household Meteorology and Physics, uh, 1934 to 1939. So, Shadows of Life, this is, this is what is in that folder that you requested. Let's see, Relative Humidity Tables. I'm going to, um, only comment briefly that I might just make a photocopy of this to stick at my desk uh, 
because my workspace uh, has been dealing with rather high relative humidity recently. Uh, <laughs> relative humidity tables. These values are correct only for an air velocity of not less than 600 feet per minute and a barometric pressure of 29.92 inches. Temperature readings in degrees Fahrenheit, humidity in percent. When extreme accuracy with wall or standing type hygrometers is desired, the instrument must be fanned vigorously until the column of the wet bulb thermometer no longer recedes. Uh, so we've got on the left, the big column on the left is readings of a dry bulb thermometer and then uh, difference between readings of wet bulb and dry bulb thermometers. I'm not sure I understand this chart. So the dry bulb thermometer reading 64 degrees versus a one degree difference to a wet bulb thermometer is a 95% humidity level. Got it. I think I got it. If it's a 21 degree difference between the wet and the dry, so the dry bulb reads 64 degrees, the wet bulb reads 21 degrees different from that, the relative humidity level is 7%. Um, so this is, that's interesting. I did not know that that was how relative humidity was actually going to be, like, measured. This is from 1920. Uh, I mean, now I just have, like, a little, I have this digital thermometer and, and humidity sensor that tells me that in this room where I presently am, it is... Uh, 74.5 degrees Fahrenheit with 52% uh, relative humidity. Um, <clears throat> so, interesting. Um, oh, it goes all the way up to 120 degrees and as low as 60 degrees for calculating it. <clears throat> U.S. Department of Agriculture Weather Bureau Annual Meteorological Summary with comparative data, 1934 and 1933, uh, Norfolk, Virginia. <clears throat> we have, to start off, a photograph of the new United States Post Office and Courthouse in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, the Weather Bureau Office and Observatory in Suite 404 on the fourth floor. Uh, meteorological summary for 1934, giving just some basic data like maximum and minimum temperatures, relative humidities, precipitation, etc. Um, various uh, temperature tables. So this is a meteorological summary with the collected data for Norfolk for 1933 and 34. Um, and then there's one document in here on the like really thin like onion skinny type paper, um, a little bit crumpled. Yeah, I, I like the charts. Um, the charts are very, uh, very much just like, this is the recorded data for Norfolk, Virginia, in 1933, this one. Monthly and annual precipitation. With your precipitation, recorded precipitations, um, by month and annually 
from 1871 to 1933. And it looks like records are in bold. I'm sure like all of that data is available online now, but it's kind of cool to see it uh, like, hey, in the 30s they were printing it. Uh, so May 29th, 1939, distinguish the three states of Wait, examination on household physics. <laughs> All right. Everybody, uh, are you ready for your physics test? <laughs> Question one, A, distinguish the three states of matter and give examples. Question one, B, what is the effect of eccentric loading on a spring balance? Question 2A, distinguish potential and kinetic energy. Question 2B, describe an aneroid barometer and state its use. <laughs> uh, I used some physics in your chosen profession, but you also used some chemistry, your worst subject in high school. What makes you laugh is that the physics you do use, your physics textbook said it was never used in the real world. I completely understand that. <clears throat> I struggled in physics in high school, uh, and the projects that I ended up doing for physics in high school uh, tended to do with um, the motion of sound waves, um, because I was interested in theater and sort of theater tech and sound and stuff like that. Um, so I remember like my physics project in high school was mapping auditory dead spots in our high school auditorium. Um, and just like sound engineering being physics was not something that I had thought of up until that point, but it definitely is. It's just physics in my brain was atomic bombs. So <laughs> um, it, it's interesting how how things pop up where even if you don't think that they're there and you don't think of them in that way, they relate back to these sort of um, general science categories. You wrote a paper in your high school physics class about how, or about some of the physics in Star Wars. Cool. Some of these questions look familiar. <laughs> uh, describe the action of a centrifugal pulp, pump. Sketch. What would 95 degrees Fahrenheit be on a centigrade scale? Uh, centigrade being an older term for what we now call Celsius. And honestly, I do not know off the top of my head what the conversion uh, between Fahrenheit and Celsius is. I will tell you that 95 degrees is somewhere in the upper 30 degrees uh, Celsius, because I know that 40 degrees Celsius is 104 Fahrenheit. Um, and I know that because London got above 40 degrees Celsius this week for the first time ever. Uh, you went for computers in school. If you could do better maths, you'd go for engineering. It's in fact your current local high and it is miserable. I don't actually know what the temperature is outside today. It was supposed to be higher than yesterday, um, but I don't actually know. So yeah, there wasn't a whole lot in the meteorology. There's the, the uh, data and statistics for Norfolk, Virginia in 1933 and 34, as well as the relative humidity calculation and a test on some basic physics questions. There was one thing I wanted to glance at really, really quickly before we leave. Um, Fahrenheit equals nine over five C plus 32. Fahrenheit equals 9 divided by 5 Celsius plus 32. My brain is not computing that, but uh, sure. You remember the numbers, but you don't know how they go together anymore? Um, uh, understandable. Uh, there was atomic... Oh. <laughs> In order to search a page in a web browser, you first have to tell it that you're searching instead of just typing. Uh, amazing that. I wanted to look at box, fol box four folder seven. Um, 
I wanted, that was one that I personally wanted to make sure that we looked at and I have not pulled out yet. So I'm gonna pull that one out now. Um, well, we have just a couple of minutes left. This folder is titled Atomic Theory. And like, I, I, the reason, partly just because atomic physics and atomic theory is interesting, uh, but also partly because the building that was named after him used to house a nuclear reactor for like an educational reactor, an actual like self-sustaining nuclear reaction was going on in that building for years. Um, so a folder labeled atomic theory seemed like something maybe I should look at. We have a really rusty paperclip that's barely holding anything together. Um, and does not appear to actually be necessary to anything in this folder. So I'm just gonna set that aside for a second here. Wow, we have pages of equations. Uh, it, it does appear that we're starting on page three with hydrogen. Um, I, I do not know what we're looking at. If somebody does, I would appreciate explanations, but then we have helium. Um, I'm uncertain. I think, is that a diagram of helium? A helium atom? I think that might be a diagram of a helium atom. I'm not sure. Huh. <laughs> Sonnenfeld applied the laws of astronomy to the motion of the electron. Electron orbital e energy equations, maybe? Possibly. Equation for energy of the different orb orbitals. The much earlier version of the theory than you studied, and that in turn was 20 plus years ago. Aside from being chemistry, you have no idea what we're looking at. Um, <laughs> this was the stuff you were terrible with in school. Um, uh, this would have been stuff that I also didn't do too great with in school. The stuff that I really enjoyed chemistry-wise was um, what we were looking at before uh, on those like slides where we had the chemical formulas and it was showing like the um, what elements were created by bombarding one with another and and what resulted and the, then the radioactive decay of it, like. Those formulas, those were something that I really enjoyed in school. Um, I never really did this, but I just, like, Sonnenfeld applied the laws of astronomy to the motion of the atom. Or electron, sorry. Um, talking about orbital mechanics and, like, that whole theory and how it plays into how we describe um, elemental nuclei. This was not what I was expecting from the atomic theory folder, but, oh, sketches instead of the meticulous drawings. Less formal sketches. Cesium. <laughs> Sonnenfeld, thankfully not Kadrax's teacher. Even with an answer key, you couldn't understand any of it. The only thing that you liked in chemistry class was working in the lab. I, what's funny is I hated the chemistry labs. I loved working with the chemical formulas. I hated going into the lab and like doing practical chemistry. Uh, but we need people that are interested in both. So theories of atomic structure. First, J.J. Thompson. Thompson assumed that electrons were stuck in the positive <laughs> in, in the positive I'm not certain what this word is, but the sentence continues like raisins in a plum pudding.
<laughs> Thompson assumed that electrons were stuck in it like raisins in a plum pudding. <laughs> Though you hadn't thought of it before, but you're guessing Sonnenfeld was named for Sommerfeld. Sommerfeld was a Prussian physicist and former dualist, which as it turns out, oh, oh, <laughs> plum pudding, as it turns out is delicious, but not an effective atomic model. Uh, Parsons Adam, uh, his theory calls attention to the fact that the electrostatic forms above are not sufficient, may Oh, magnetic form must be considered in order to account for the formation of molecules. See, it, this is like actually like this theories of atomic structure. This is this is atomic theory, and this is uh, from 1925 is when these notes are from. I think this is probably when he was studying atomic physics, not teaching it. But I would have to double check like the dates in the finding aid to be sure of that. But this seems more like student notes to me. Uh, Rydberg found that n equals 2 times 1 plus 2 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 4 squared plus dot 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 with, uh, where n is atomic number, a formula for atomic number. Langman's atom, I think. He divides his skills with compartments. I'm not, sh shells. He divides his shells with compartments having the having them electrons are introduced into them uh, or they're into their nucleus until uh, until they're all in lock, accounts for the appearance of such squared number. Yeah, uh, a little bit difficult to make out the writing on that one, and I'm not familiar with the theory, so uncertain, but anyway. Uh, plum pudding model was replaced by the Bohr orbital model, which is what you think these equations are for. Positive charge. Yeah, electrons are stuck in the positive charge. Oh! Yes! Yes, that's what it says. Uh, a good Reinhardt charge. Ha <laughs> ha, shadows of life, good. Pre-orbital probability theories. Yeah, this is really cool. Like 1925 atomic theory notes. Um, I just, it's absolutely amazing to me. Um, and I am very much an amateur with regard to uh, like atomic theory, um, atomic physics in general. I find it fascinating. I've never studied it. Uh, uh, but I, I find it interesting and understand a little bit of it from a chemistry perspective. But um, these notes are really interesting to me. I, I have never looked at this collection before and I think this collection is absolutely fascinating. I wish I could spend just days diving into it and just finding all of the little gems that are in there. I think this folder is actually a gem. Um, Lectures on Atomic Theory by Dr. A.H. 
fund. Possibly. It looks like P-F-U-N-D, but I don't know if that's October 10th, 1922. And it's just lecture notes. Like, but absolutely cool. Like, this is decades before the Manhattan Project uh, produced an atomic bomb. This is early, like, studies understandings of atomic theory and atomic physics and I just think it's really interesting um, anyway we are at three minutes over uh, I'm gonna pop back to uh, my face and we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the stream here um, thank you all for joining me today I hope that this was interesting for you um, August Fund, that I did spell it correctly. He was at Johns Hopkins. Awesome key squared. So yeah, I, I do hope that you all found this um, to be interesting. I thought this was a really cool collection. I'm, I'm glad I picked it. Um, we barely scratched the surface of this collection. There's so much more in here. Um, what I have planned for next week is a collection titled The Los Angeles Poverty Department Collection, which I'm guessing none of you will accurately predict what it is a collection of, um, but the Los Angeles Poverty Department Collection is a theater collection. Uh, so <laughs> I have no idea what's in it, <coughs> but we're going to pull it. Uh, off the shelves and I'm going to bring it in here and we're going to take a look at it next week. Uh, so for now though, let me look and see who we're going to raid. Um, and I, I do think that we are going to pop over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium today. Uh, and so unless... I just want to check and see, I don't think. Yeah, no. Okay. I was if Librarian Liz had still been live, we would have we would have gone over there. But um, but she's not, so we will say hello to the wonderful people at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, it I'm not sure which camera it is today. Possibly penguins. Uh, but Thank you all so very much for joining me today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure looking at these materials for me. Hopefully it was good for you. Um, hopefully I see you again for another archival stream. Uh, I'm here every Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and it's a variety of things. Uh, today was physics, next week is theater. Who knows what I'll find in the archives and, and choose to just bring on and, and we'll explore it together and see what we can learn. Um, Hopefully you found this enjoyable. Uh, until I see you next, I hope that you continue to enjoy exploring history. Um, thanks. Bye.